I want to talk about one of the main misconceptions that I often find on forums or the YouTube comments section related to World War II aviation. It has to do with a seemingly widespread lack of distinction and understanding relating to plane durability and armor. Now before we dive into the matter, let's start this off with a thought exercise. I will put out a couple of statements and you decide for yourself whether you agree with them or not. Here it goes. American bombers like the B-17s were incredibly hard to shoot down because they were so well armored. The Japanese planes of World War II were very easy to shoot down because they had no armor protection. The P-47 Thunderbolt was able to shrug off most hits and continue flying because of its armor. I'm sure a number of you will recognize these kind of hypotheses that you often find on the internet. So let's start to test these theories. Let's start by comparing two fighters, the Japanese Ki-43 II and the P-47. Here is an image of both aircraft. Now I will add the respective armor protection of the Ki-43-2. And now I will add the armor protection of the P-47. Yep, that is it, nothing else. The fighter that is considered to be the tankiest of all World War II fighters has pretty much the exact same armor layout as a Japanese plane. And Japanese planes are often considered to be not protected at all. Here is the thing. Generally speaking, World War II fighters are not really armored. Armor is heavy, not something you want weighing you down. The backplate of the P-47, for example, is 10mm thick. That's enough for rifle caliber bullets or glances by high caliber hits. Of course, next to the thickness, the hardness matters, but that is a discussion for another time. Armor also reduces the kinetic energy of the round that penetrates it. So even though a bullet might very well pass through the armor plate, it will come out on the other side with too little inertia to do really any more damage. As a general rule, armor in World War II fighters can only be found protecting the pilot, and that only from low caliber bullets. Alright, let's expand this a little bit. Of course, next to armor, you want to include some other forms of protection in your plane, like bullet-resistant glass or protection to the fuel tanks. However, that is usually not armor. This kind of secondary protection is better than nothing, but it will not magically soak up bullets like there is no tomorrow. To get protection from lower calibers, you already need a respectable diameter of armor, which is heavy. Imagine putting that everywhere on a plane, and you'll see that performance will suffer big time. So. Then the question is, what makes the P-47 so good at taking damage if it's not armor? Well, build quality amongst one thing. It also featured good secondary protection, like protected fuel tanks and armored glass. By the way, as a side note, protected fuel tanks in the context of World War II aviation usually does not mean protected by armor. But actually, usually it was rubber or some other kind of materials. In contrast to the Ki-43, which by the way also featured some secondary protection, the P-47 was very rugged and tough. Next to specific performance characteristics, it was built to take damage and come back flying. The airframe reflects this. The design philosophy of the Ki-43 was somewhat different. Now this is why the P-47 was able to soak up the damage that the Ki-43 couldn't, not because it was necessarily better armored. Now one plane that had no armor protection or secondary protection was the A6M0. Well, Actually, at least only the early models. The A6M5 actually featured armor for the pilot and additional secondary protection, similar to the one that you'll find in the P-47. But again, it would lose out in ruggedness. Of course, throughout World War II, fighters would sometimes be fitted with extra armor depending on operational needs. Fokkerwolf 190 Sturmbock is a good example. But again, the armor plate was usually enough for small caliber bullets and made fit for purpose not a guarantee for survival. All right, so let's go to the B-17. The biggest compliment to the B-17 is also its biggest disservice. During World War II, one reporter saw a B-17, guns sticking out left, right, bottom, top, back, front and center, and called them Flying Fortresses. It's an absolutely brilliant name. The only problem is that too often this nickname is taken at face value and this image of a well-protected and armored four-engine bomber comes to mind. Was the B-17 well-protected for a plane of its time? Yes. Was it armored? Well, in a way, but let's dig deeper. Here is the layout of the armor protection of the B-17. As you will notice when we go through this, armor tends to be concentrated around the crew, 
rather than the airplane itself. We have a frontal armor plating wall, essentially dividing the frontal compartment from the rest of the aircraft. The bombardier and navigator have no frontal protection though. Then the pilots and co-pilot seats are armored, as is the compartment wall behind them. The radio operator has an armored seat and the bottom gunner has a small protective plate. The waist gunners also have some armor on their individual sides and the tail gunner has another small plate. Beyond that, the only thing armored in the B-17 is the autopilot servo motor. That's it. And believe me, that is pretty good for a World War II bomber. Now next to bullet resistant glass protecting the crew from low caliber rounds, the fuel tanks are protected. But again, that is secondary protection. There are still plenty of avenues for a bullet to penetrate the outer layer and kill someone or do damage to the aircraft. The B-17 is once again a rotted plane. It was built for war, designed to take bullets, not to make them ricochet off like a tank. It would take a disproportionate amount of armor to actually fully protect an aircraft from incoming fire, to the point where it could probably no longer take off. Now one thing you might say now at this point is, hang on a second. What about planes like the Soviet IO-2? They were well armored. Yes, for a plane of their time they were really well armored. Let's have a look. Here is an IO-2. The effective armor thickness did vary a bit between some of the early and later variants, but the change was minimal. So the IL-2 is essentially protected what is often called a bathtub. Now the IL-2's engine was protected all round by around 4 to 5 millimeters. The cooling system was also protected. The closer we get to the pilot, the thicker the armor gets. The pilot had some very thick protection for the time, 12 millimeters in some cases. The gunner also eventually received a protective plate. The plane has no other armor to speak of. And this actually shows you the priorities the Soviets, along with most other nations in World War II, had. When forced between having to choose armor for the plane system or armor for the pilot, the pilot or crew was given priority. They could have done it so that the engine, for example, had more armor thickness or that it was more even throughout, but they didn't. The pilot is the asset worth protecting. The plane itself is replaceable and simply meant to get him back to safety when necessary. Other specialized planes existed, like the German Henschel 129, that featured prominent armor protection for the pilot. In the Henschel 129, it was up to 12 mm and it even had small armor boxes for the oil and fuel tank, around 6 mm. It also had 75 mm of armored glass. The P-39 also featured some interesting internal protection, but these were exceptions rather than the norm. Most protection was centered around the pilot or crew, sometimes with several thin non-armor layers creating compartments within the structure in the hope of reducing the bullet's inertia once it gets to the final plate of the pilot. Instead of armor then, aircraft tend to stay in the air because of rugged construction and secondary protection for vulnerable parts like the fuel tanks. The armor does its job by protecting the pilot, not the plane. A great example of this might very well be the British Wellington. Its construction is essentially nothing but a metal mesh with canvas strapped around it. Not at all bullet resistant, to the detriment of the crew, but very hard to destroy by conventional means. Now I hope that you enjoyed this video and if you want to see more content on military aviation, consider checking out my Patreon. Support over Patreon allows me to buy more resources for this channel, such as books and other materials, and directly influences my ability to invest more time into it. Just a dollar or two can already make a big difference. Before you leave, make sure you pass by those like buttons on your way out and to share this video with your friends. If you want to know more about how the Soviets used the IL-2, check out this video. Or, if you are interested in why bombing was so difficult during World War II, check out this video. As always, I hope you have a great day, good hunting, and see you in the sky.